Well, it's an enormous pleasure to be here. I'm sorry I can't speak to you in the, be in the beautiful German language, um, but I'm touched by Rolf Fuchs's introduction. Um, uh, he and I have become good friends, and I hope he feels the same warmth coming from me that I get from him when he introduces me. Um, I'm also, frankly, stunned that anybody's in the room at all. This is the most beautiful day of the year in Berlin. You guys are crazy. You should be outside. Um, so I hope we'll have a good, vigorous uh, discussion and that uh, we'll be able to get out before uh, the beautiful day is gone. Um, it's a beautiful day, uh, and you are among the luckiest human beings in the world because you live in a Reichstadt, you live in a society that has thought about its past and thought deeply about its responsibilities. Um, and about two hours flying time from here, uh, there are people being massacred uh, in small villages in Syria. There are uh, Sunnis being slaughtered by um, Alawite militias. There are Alawites fearing for their lives. We've been here before. Um, Germans remember in the 90s in Bosnia, sitting here in safety and feeling very close by that they were in a zone of safety and a zone of not only danger but a zone of horror was very close. And this aroused deep questions about your moral conscience as individuals but also deep questions about your identity as a people. Uh, and this question about your identity as a people was posed by the horror in Bosnia and then later by the crimes in Kosovo. And it took us a very long time, let's remember. The bad stuff began in Bosnia in 1992, and it wasn't until 1995, and there were 400,000 refugees in, Bos in Bosnia in Germany, and you were supporting them. And it wasn't act until three years had elapsed before intervention occurred. Um, and... I want to begin there because we're reliving this experience of modernity, which is central to our experience of modernity, safety, sunlight, wonderful infrastructure, and two hours away, total Hobbesian terror for people just like us, right? No more fanatic than us, no more unreasonable than us, no more... No different from us in any way. Uh, we've been here in the Balkans. We're here now in Syria. And it remains not just a foreign policy problem, an interesting foreign policy problem that policy intellectuals like me talk about. It's an urgent moral dilemma, a challenge to our identity, and a fundamental aspect of living in the modern world. Zones of safety next door to zones of horror. I go back to the Bosnian case to make one simple point because one of the things that you have to watch, I think, in thinking about intervention is the conventional wisdom about intervention, and there's some reason for the conventional wisdom, is that intervention never works. Iraq, disaster. Afghanistan, not so great. Um, Kosovo, not terrific. Um, all I'd want us to remember is some simple facts. Nobody's dying in Bosnia. It's not great in Bosnia. It's not terrific. I wouldn't over-claim that the solution to the horrible ethnic wars of the 90s we've fixed the problem, or that the Bosnians have fixed the problem. I'd only say this, no one's dying in Kosovo, no one's dying in Bosnia. And lest we succumb to the argument that interventions are always futile, it's worth remembering. 
that no one's dying two hours from here anymore. And that seems to me a huge and important uh, victory. Um, My experience in the uh, responsibility to protect commission arose out of our attempts to think through the lessons of Kosovo and Bosnia. One of the problems that emerged from that experience was a sense that legality and legitimacy had fragmented in the Kosovo intervention. Most most of the German public, most of the Canadian public, most of the American public thought that the Kosovo, Kosovo intervention was legitimate in normative moral terms. It just didn't happen to be legal in international law because it didn't get approval of the Security Council. So when you ask where did responsibility to protect and all that doctrine came from, it came from a desire to try and re-solder legitimacy and legality, normative principles and principles of international law, and develop a set of criteria for intervention that would create a new international consensus about how we decide these difficult questions about when people in zones of safety should rescue people in zones of danger. And without going through the work of the International Commission much, although it was work I was proud to take part in, and one of your great German generals, a great German patriot who I'm very fond of, Klaus Naumann, who was part of that commission, um, we met and came up with the idea, two ideas really. We tried to get people to think that intervention is not merely a discretionary right that's left at the discretion of powerful states. It's an obligation. It's a responsibility, right? That was the first move. And it was a responsibility that was triggered when another sovereign state made war on its own people. We tried to set the barrier quite high. People think of responsibility to protect as an intervener's charter. That's quite wrong. It was, in fact, a reaffirmation of the importance of sovereignty in the modern world, but it said when a state begins to butcher and massacre its own people, subject them to aerial bombardment, mass deportation, when these killings rise to the level of massacre or genocidal killing, at that point, no sovereign keeps its right to be a sovereign state. At that moment... Its right to be a sovereign state is suspended and other states have an obligation, a positive obligation, to intervene to stop that kind of killing. And our vision was, this is an important point about this, is that intervention is not social work. It's not humanitarian compassion. It's not uh, saving our souls or saving someone else's soul. What intervention is, is to stop those forms of crime internal to a state that are a threat to international peace and security. We tried to re-solder together important principles that things that are a threat to your conscience are also a threat to peace and security, and you have to integrate in your understanding the idea that things that shock your conscience are dangerous to the international state order. Where did we learn that? We learned that in Rwanda. In 1994, we sat and watched why 800,000 people were massacred in a small country that most of us couldn't find on a map, and I include myself. And we discovered that a supposedly internal massacre in a faraway African state once it stopped, acted to destabilize the entire state order of Central Africa. And from that day forward, from the end of that massacre, the disintegration of Congo began. The Third World War in Africa began after Rwanda. If you think of Rwanda simply as a humanitarian catastrophe that shocks your conscience, you're missing what was truly terrible about it was that it started the Third World War in Africa, and it's still not over. And stability in that vast central region of Africa is still not secure. 
So responsibility to protect was trying to get us to think of issues of conscience as issues of strategy at the same time. And we tried to set a very high bar barrier for intervention because we live in a post-imperial world and no one wants strong states walking into weak states and dictating their futures to them. So we tried to reconcile the principle of, of intervention with the principle of self-determination, which we all care about. We tried to reconcile, in fact, intervention with the principle of sovereignty. Why do we care about sovereignty? Because it allows people to be masters in their own house and masters of their own destiny. And when the doctrine came out, we tried to say, first, intervention is not a discretionary right, it's a positive obligation. And secondly, sovereignty is not simply a guarantee of inviolability. It's a basic responsibility to the international order on the one hand, and it's a responsibility to your own people on the other. That's what we said. That was the contribution. Where are we 13 years later? I want to get us back to Syria, and then I want to shut up and sit down and listen to you and respond to your comments. We're not in a good place. Um, the first place, I think, in which the responsibility to protect doctrine was applied, as you know, was in Libya. Germany sat that one out. There are a lot of Germans who look back and think, that wasn't such a smart idea. There are other Germans who feel very passionately it was the right thing to do. You have a particular tradition, a particular past, a particular relation to the use of military force, and that's something the Germans have to sort out for themselves, and it's an active and passionate debate and um, I'm not sure you want some outsider giving you lessons. But you stayed out. The interesting thing about uh, the Libyan operation was that we said um, uh, we got to protect civilians in Benghazi. Gaddafi's going to massacre civilians in Benghazi. You'll remember that moment when it appeared clear, when he began talking about other human beings as cockroaches, that's a little takeaway for all of you. When you hear a politician or leader talking about another human being as a cockroach, you know one thing. Nothing good will come from that. Trouble is about to start. Somebody's about to die. When he used the languages of cockroaches to describe the citizens of Benghazi, that was a trigger that reminded everybody of similar language used in Rwanda. So we went in with uh, air air power authorized by the United Nations uh, and uh, with the Chinese and Russians kind of holding their nose. Um, now, the issue that was raised by, by, Lib by Libya was, could you do civilian protection? Could you protect those people in Benghazi without regime change? Was R2P equivalent to RC? R2P becomes regime change. Can you do civilian protection without regime change? And this is, the, this is the moment at which the R2P language began to break apart. Western countries said, you can't protect civilians in Libya unless you take Gaddafi out. And that then meant we began thumping regime targets pretty hard through September and October, and a lot of German citizens, a lot of Western citizens didn't like how that was done. But that's a hard question for you in this audience. Can you do civilian protection without regime change? It's not obvious to me that you can. So that's one issue we have to answer honestly. And this is where the BRICS come in. This is where the Brazilians who were on the Security Council at that point, they said they didn't like that idea. They voted for civilian protection, but they did not vote for regime change, to which we said excuse my language, give me a break here. How do you honestly suppose you can protect civilians in Libya if you leave the dictator Gaddafi in place? So people listen to the Brazilians. The Brazilians are an important rising power. It's incredibly important that they're part of this debate, but I frankly disagreed with them about this. I just thought it was naive to suppose that you could uh, protect civilians without changing despotic regimes. So that's one area where the debate will be focused, and we should have a discussion about that. And in parenthesis, I would say, and this is said now as a Canadian, putting on a Canadian hat, one of the difficult things that we had to learn about 
the use of military power. And this will not necessarily be happily received in this audience, and I'm not saying this to provoke you, is you cannot protect civilians unless you have a combat-capable military. It's as simple as that. This is not work for Boy Scouts. This is not work for people with blue helmets and sidearms. This is, a, this is work for people who can take and return fire. And if you don't know that, you don't know what Srebrenica was all about. The Dutch were given a mandate, a formal international mandate, to protect 10,000 fellow human beings. And when Mladic came over the hill, they had nothing to stop him. And 10,000 people were massacred in the worst act of mass killing since the Second World War. You don't give a promise to protect civilians unless you have a combat-capable military who can deliver on the promise. It's that simple. If you're not willing to do that, don't even start. That's the tough stuff. And don't hear me as a warmonger. One of the things that was very strong about the responsibility to protect doctrine was its revival of Catholic just war doctrine. The best and smartest things ever said about the use of military instrument were said by St. Ambrose and St. Augustine 2,000 years ago. If you raise the sword, it must be a last resort. If you raise the sword, you must have reasonable prospects of success. Don't raise the sword unless it's the last resort, and don't raise it if you have reasonable prospects, the right intentions, just authority, right? So don't hear this as a warmonger's charter, but do hear it. Don't make promises to civilians if you can't keep it. Stay at home. But if you're going to protect civilians, you've got to go in there and protect them with uh, the potential to kill those, I said kill, who are trying to kill those civilians. Hopefully you dissuade them, hopefully you deter them, hope you don't need to kill anybody, but don't fool around with this stuff. And it's burned into the soul of the Dutch army. Just imagine the disgrace that a nation feels when it makes a promise to protect civilians and then watches its military stand idly by while people are killed. It's not a good thing for a country to go through. And there but for the grace of God would have gone Canada had we been on picket duty. So we concluded if you're going to make a promise to protect civilians, you better keep it. And that means as citizens you have to pay for the military means to do that. That's a big German debate and you'll have to think about what you do about that. Let's get to Syria because it's where I started and I'll stop there. We've got nothing but bad options here, as everybody knows. But I think it's wrong to start the debate on Syria by regarding all interventions as bound to fail in advance. Remember what I said before. It took three years to intervene in Bosnia, but nobody's dying in Bosnia. And that's a good thing. Um, what kind of thing might possibly work in Syria? Uh, my sense here is that there is a 5 to 15% chance, maybe only 5% actually, but let's hold on to any chance we can get, that the United States and the Russians are getting together and deciding that this, Sir this Syrian crisis is a threat to their vital interest. It's a threat to Israel. It's a threat to the state order in the Middle East. It's a threat to... Iran, it's a threat to Iraq, it's a threat to Jordan, it's a threat to Lebanon. It is, in fact, the dissolution of the Sykes-Pico order at the end that was created at the end of uh, the Versailles uh, period, and therefore it is a threat to the state order of a whole region. Notice what I'm saying here. It's not just bad news. It's not just people being slaughtered. It's a threat to international peace and security. It's a threat to the state order of a whole region. You can't separate humanitarian crisis from strategic considerations. You have to bring them together if you're going to get anybody to do anything. All motives in international life are mixed Pure humanitarian motive never convinced anybody. You have to convince people that strategic interests are in play, okay? So strategic interests are in play in, uh, in Syria. The Russians have a strategic choice to make whether they decide that they will suddenly become part of the post-Assad strategic solution whether they can preserve their interests in the Mediterranean, whether they can preserve their bases, their historical connection to Syria by 
basically turning around and saying to Assad, it's time to go to your dacha in Moscow. Why would the Russians want to do that? Because they think Assad is going to lose. Why does As- why would Assad go to a peace conference? Because he thinks he's going to lose. Does Assad think he's going to lose? Not at the moment. That's the problem. The military balance is stalemated. Uh, and in a stalemate, a stalemate favors the regime, unfortunately. Long term, Assad thinks he can hold on. It's at this point that the decision, the strategic decision I think the West has to make is whether it wants to issue a credible threat to Assad. The credible threat is not that we're going to arm the militias. I'm against arming the militias because I don't know where the hell these weapons go to and I don't know who they go to. But you could have the Russians, Lavrov, pass a message to Assad that says the United States is going to bomb your airfields. We're going to take out your capacity to use air power. Issue a credible threat of that kind, and that might make Assad realize the military balance is going to tip, and he better come to the table to save what he can. In return, the United States, and I I see this language already out there, the United States says we are not going to repeat the mistakes we made in Iraq. We are going to leave... The, the, the institutional structure of the Ba'ath regime in place. We're not going to try and dismantle the army in a peace settlement. We're not going to dismantle the state structures, the bureaucracy. We're going to leave it in place. Notice what I'm saying here. From a human rights point of view, this is poison. It leaves a lot of bad guys in place. It's a clear choice between peace and justice. Right? If you choose justice, you insist in an épuration totale of that regime. If you want peace, if you want an end to the civil war, you've got to leave a lot of bad people in place. I'm trying to focus these things so that we, we get to the real issues. And all of the issues are tough. Do I like this? I don't like it one bit. All right? You choose peace rather than justice, and you put in touch a deal which promises the Syrian regime that all is not lost. Then you try and get refugee return. Then you try and do something else that's very important from a from a human rights point of view. Um, everybody likes protecting innocent victims, and no one likes protecting the human rights of the guilty. One of the things you want to be absolutely sure of is that they don't massacre every last Alawite, every last member of the regime, right? So if you're going to have peace in Syria, not necessarily peace with justice, but peace in Syria, you probably have to have some international peacekeeping force to prevent intersectarian massacre, right? And you're going to have to protect some bad people because that's that's how you build a future. You make sure that bad people don't feel they're fighting for their lives, that they've got a future in a country that they can build with their former enemies. All of this is ugly, difficult work, and it has about a 5% chance of succeeding. But the alternative, it seems to me, is an indefinite civil war that burns Syrian society down to the waterline. The Lebanese civil war went on for many years. Uh, It's entirely possible that the great powers will decide, let it burn. We let it burn. You think 80,000 casualties is bad. It'll be 150,000, 200,000. And we will be back to the most uncomfortable experience of modernity, which is living in perfect zones of safety, watching people die two hours away in zones of danger. It's not a world I want to be in. I don't think it's a world you want to be in either. Thanks for listening.